there are four teenagers. You've tasked them with painting a room. You've given them buckets of paint. All they're supposed to do is pick a color and start painting. It's a very simple one-day task. You're expecting that when you walk into the room, at the end of the evening, there'll be a freshly painted room. You walk in five days later, and you realize not only have they not started painting the room, they're still bickering over which color to pick. The first one says, blue, oh, we can't do blue. Blue is too common. Every other room in the house is blue in color. The second one says, oh, let's not do red. Red is too depressing. The third one says, green. Oh, we can't do green. Why not just because I hate green? That's it. Let's not do green. Unfortunately, these are not some imaginary teenagers. This is me and my founders. And we weren't trying to paint a room. We were actually trying to pick the color scheme of our app as a part of a rebranding exercise that we did last year. This rebranding exercise was supposed to take us six months. But because it was so critical for us, the team literally pulled all-nighters and got it ready in three short weeks. At the end of these nightmarish three weeks, I decided I'm going to take a break. I hopped onto a flight to Italy. And I was expecting that while I'm midair, my team would have launched the app back to our customers. When I land in Italy, I realize not only has the app not been launched to our customers, the founders are yet to align on specifically which shade of blue we are OK with. Over the next 10 long days, I'm walking in the alleys of Italy, sipping coffee in the piazzas of Siena, all this while on very frustrating calls with my founders as we are debating every shade of blue. We are literally exchanging WhatsApp images of the shade card and saying, this works for me, this doesn't work for me. When we couldn't align on blue, we went back to other colors. Between the four of us, we literally vetoed the entire RGB spectrum. Now, these are not just co-founders. They're close friends of mine. I'll just show you a picture uh, of them. And uh, you know, uh, we all, this is a photo of us uh, when we were uh, watching the World Cup in Russia. Uh, and we have this tradition of watching World Cups. I'm hoping we are able to gonna be able to do it this time around as well. Uh, but these are close friends of mine. Ranveer and I are often sipping a cup of chai on the office patio and mindlessly discussing the nuances of the Second World War. Krishnan and I are often in his cabin dissecting the strategies of consumer tech startups all across the globe. And Sonali and I are grabbing a cup of coffee, exchanging office gossip, and our pursuit of ideas. But you take any combination of these four, place them into a meeting room in our office where any important decision has to be taken, and you can see them fight. There is bitter acrimony. There are zealous debates, and there is fighting like kindergarten kids. Often, we are just short of flinging chairs at each other. Now. You have to ask, this bitter acrimony has to be value destroying for the company. You have to question whether these are the people who are trying to build a company, or are these the same people who are trying to raise it down to the ground, right? But we are a success. Ring started in 2015 when digital lending as a concept did not exist in India. And we are here today where Ring is able to do loans in under five minutes for our customers right from app download all the way to money hitting their bank accounts. And we've done this not for tens of thousands of customers. We've done it for 16 million Indians already. We are empowering Indians pretty much in all walks of life, right from a vegetable vendor who's using our credit to buy produce in the morning, go off to the market, sell it off to his customers by evening, and make a living for himself. And we are also powering loans for young working professionals who are using this to buy their dream iPhones. A very large part of this success offering is what I attribute to the friction between the four of us. This friction pushes us to debate every important discussion. It forces us to make sure that we razor sharp our thinking and make sure that we come up with the right decisions, whether it's customer experience, risk, or even profitability. Let me give you a couple of examples. In our early days, we used to have this offer screen for our customers where a customer would come in, play with the toggle, select the loan amount that works for him, also select the tenure that he's comfortable paying. This page was also where we saw the maximum drop-offs. My founder suggested, let's get rid of this choice for the customers. 
let's replace it with a fixed loan amount and a fixed tenure, and let's make it a binary choice of the customers. They either take it or leave it. The product designer in me revolted. I'm like, we can't do that. I come from a line of thinking where you leave the important choices to your customers. You present the options to them, you communicate the options very well to them, and you trust their intelligence to make the right decisions for themselves. But I relented. We agreed to do a small pilot with a fixed offer model. And as much as it hurts my ego, I have to admit that it worked. It worked well, so well that for the last seven years, that's the model that we stuck by. You know, and there are many other converse examples as well. For example, we used to have an auto debit setup page. Uh, customers in India for all loans had to set up a mandate to pay their EMIs. They had to come, come up front before taking the loan and go through a very, very clunky process. Now, this process is something I always hated. I always thought that, okay, this is where the customers are experiencing the most friction. So I proposed to my founders, let's get rid of this page completely. Let's make a very, very seamless customer experience. The thesis was that a customer who has the right intent to pay is going to come back on your app on the due date and make the payment as long as you communicate the payment date to him well enough. My founders called me naive. They said, Karan, you've lost it. Sonali barged into my cabin and said, Karan, you're an engineer and a CTO. Please stick to your side of the aisle. Don't take risk decisions. Leave them to us. But after a lot of debates, a lot of discussion, and a lot of fighting, it was me against three, uh, I did prevail to do a pilot, uh, and we did it. And guess what? For the last three years, we haven't done a single loan that requires this clunky process as a part of the journey. And in spite of having one of the most friction-free experiences for our customers, we have one of the lowest non-performing assets in our peer set. You know, the entire journey of Ring, right from 2015 till today, has been made on the back of such heavily contested decisions. If I had left all of the product choices to my founders, our app would have looked like one very big Google form, bunch of form fields, a customer would come in, manually type out all the information, press a button, and wait for two weeks while we couriered a check to him. Now, if we left all of these choices to me, my app would have looked immaculate. One single big clean page with a big button that says, get my money now. Our customer would come in, click it, and boom, the money would be in his bank account. And guess what? I would give a loan to anyone who applied. Now, of course, you can imagine in either of those situations, the company would have been six feet under a long time ago, and I wouldn't be right here in front of you. As much as this friction, of course, has benefits for the company's outcomes, there are a lot of personal benefits too. My investment banking, first principle driven, bean counting of founders swear by their Excel. They love their Excel so much that sometimes I suspect they are wrapping their biases in Excel formulas, presenting them as business models and projections to justify their decisions. I decided I'm gonna break their stranglehold on that. I decided I'm gonna get savvy at Excel. And over the last few years, I'm very confident to say that I'm an Excel ninja. Now, my founders were, of course, inspired and partly jealous. So what did Ranveer and Sonali do? They said, oh, we're going to learn Python. Why would they learn Python? Because the biggest contention in our company is always around engineering estimates. What they think should take three days, we quote as three weeks. They think this should be done overnight, so something that's usually a one-week-long process. But they decided that they're going to get good at it. They signed up for online courses, and you can imagine how that went. Beyond saying hello world, there's not much else that they can do in Python. Engineering one, business zero. Now, of course, this friction plays out. It, it's there in almost all walks of our lives. And you have to ask, is there a playbook to managing this friction between founders? Well, let me ask you another question. Why do you want to manage this friction? Why not instead channelize this friction? This friction can be channelized for good outcomes for your organization. Whether it's a good product for your customers, whether it's more value for your shareholders, or a better organization for your employees. This has to be managed. And as much as this friction is sort of a taboo topic, you don't hear a lot of people talk about the friction between founders, it's permeable in all walks of the startup ecosystem. 
look around you and you'll see most startups usually have co-founders, multiple founders, especially true when you look at founders who are the first time founders, the, they're starting their first startup, they will always be in pair. And trust me, this is not limited to just complementary skill sets. You talk to seed investors and Series A investors and they'll tell you that they're much more likely to write a check if they're talking to a pair of founders or more founders than a single solo founder. I believe in the power of friction between founders so much that whenever a solo founder comes to me and asks me for advice, the very primary advice I give them is please find yourself an equally passionate co-founder. You know, a single founder tends to get lazy. Partners keep each other very, very accountable and more importantly, very, very real. And of course, in the course of your startup journey, you will come to a lot of places where the friction gets too hot to handle. What do you do then? Well, at least I can tell you what I do. Whenever we have a very acrimonious debate where we are just short of flinging chairs at each other, at the end of that discussion, right in the meeting room, I'll just go walk up to my founders and ask them, chai peena hai? which means, do you want to grab a cup of chai? And <clears throat> while we are having that chai and having some really mindless conversations, you know, the sweet of the chai is washing away the bitterness between those founders. And more importantly, it signals to each other that, you know what, everything is okay between us. We are cool. Everything is okay in the organization and in the larger world. Thank you, everyone.